All right. Welcome back. Hope you are rested, hydrated, all of that good stuff. Next up, uh, we have, there you go, very nice. Uh, we have Jonathan Wong. Uh, as a reminder, the Slack channel for Q&A is at the bottom here. Uh, we'll put that at the bottom of each um, as we begin each talk so that you can see which channel. That way, Jonathan can keep an eye on the questions, and we will know where to look for the live Q&A at the end of the talk, uh, which will happen right after. So um, <laughs> Jonathan is on the move at the moment. <laughs> The joys of being at home. <laughs> All right, uh, Jonathan, anything you want to say before we jump in? Yeah, hey, uh, how's it going, everybody? I had to uh, move away from my uh, kid playing Lego. So, um, yeah, I uh, thanks for coming to my talk, and uh, I hope you all enjoy it. And I'll try to answer any questions that come up best I can, um, either during the session or after. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Wong, and welcome to my talk, Build an Analytics SDK with Combine. I'm super excited to be here, and I hope you enjoy my talk. So up until about a year ago, I had never done any reactive programming. Things like Rx Swift had always interested me, but I never spent the time learning it or had the opportunity to use it on the job. Then Apple released Combine about a year ago, and I figure, OK, now's as good as time as any start learning this reactive programming model. I wanted to take a look at Combine and see how we can leverage it outside the context of Swift UI and UIKit. In order to do that, I figured it would be best to look at an existing SDK and try to rebuild it in Combine and see where it makes our life easier or maybe even harder. I also wanted to prepare this talk to share how analytics SDKs work or SDKs in the marketing technology space in general. As developers, it's our responsibility to understand any third-party dependency we choose to bring into our project. Sometimes those dependencies work, and sometimes they may not work. So it might be something that you might just want to build yourself. So that brings me to which SDK we're going to look at. Well, in my day job, I work at a company called Telium, building data collection libraries for our customer data hub platform. Let's take a look at it. At a high level, you send data to the platform you can enrich that data within the platform, perform actions or connectors based on the data, and even perform machine learning on your visitors. So if you wanted to send a coupon to one of your VIP customers or a notification to a gamer who just completed a level and got a high score, that's something you can configure on the platform. So how does this SDK work? I like to think of it as performing three main steps, collection of the data, validation of the data, and finally, dispatching the data to the platform. Now, what type of data do we collect? Don't worry, it's nothing fishy. It's data any developer could collect. Let's take a look at that collection module. We have various modules that collect data specific to their module. For example, there's an app module that collects things like app name and your app version. There's a device module that collects things like what type of device you're on. Are you on an iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro? Which operating version of iOS are you using? 13, 12? Did you upgrade to iOS 14 yet? As well as things like your orientation. Are you using the app and performing this action while you're in portrait or landscape mode? This module is also used in validation. We're cognizant of the app experience, and we don't want to have to send data if you have low battery or you're on cellular. So those are things that you can configure within the SDK. Another group of information that marketers often want to know is the life cycle of their app. How many times has this app been launched? How many days since the last launch? Next up is the connectivity module. The connectivity module is what it sounds like. It gets information on what type of network you're using. Are you on Wi-Fi or cellular? Then there are other modules, some optional, like the new location module. If you want to send a coupon to one of your VIP customers as they're entering your store, you can do so if the user shares their location with you. In the end, you're going to run into something that looks like this, telium.track, or insert your favorite vendor name, dot, log event, track purchase, send screen view, track screen view. It all starts to sound kind of the same after a while, followed by the event name, in this case, level complete, and depending on the vendor and platform you use, 
some optional or required parameters. In this case, we're setting the level 19 and the score 5000. It's at this point that the SDK asks the other individual modules for their data. I like to think of this as a pull model. The core module is pulling the data from the individual modules. Let's imagine what this might look like without using combine. Here, we're showing two modules, the app info module and the device info module. They both conform to a collector protocol that has one method, collect, that returns a string any dictionary. Each of these modules use an internal model to calculate the data they need to populate the dictionary in the collect method. As you can see on the left, the app info model is used to get the app name and the app version. On the right, the device info module uses static methods to calculate device information. Other instance methods are also used in the device info module that aren't shown on this slide. So when that tracking call is made, the core module asks all of its individual modules for their data so it can package it up into a request object as seen here. Then the core module adds any platform specific data it needs. And finally, we pass in any client information that was in the request. So if you remember, that was level complete along with the level 19 and the score 5000. Let's look at a quick overview of Combine. Combine has publishers, operators, and subscribers. Publishers send values over time. They also can send a completion event or a completion event with an error of the publisher's failure type. Operators receive values from other publishers or operators and perform an action on them before passing them to another operator or the subscriber. Subscribers sit at the end of the chain, subscribing to an operator or another publisher where you would receive those events and then typically perform an action on them. If you're familiar with Notification Center, I like to think of Combine as being a similar model. In Notification Center, you post or publish a notification, and on the receiving end, you subscribe or observe that notification and perform an action on it. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have an integer array. Then we can use dot publisher to create a publisher for that array. Then if we use the map operator, just like the Swift standard library of map, we can change an integer to a string with a dash before and after the integer. Finally, we subscribe to that operator with sync. Within sync, when we receive the value, we print it. And lastly, we store the subscription. When a subscriber subscribes to a publisher, it creates a subscription, which represents the connection from a subscriber to a publisher. If the subscription goes out of scope, the subscription will automatically cancel. So storing the subscription like so is pretty much what you're gonna to wanna to do most of the time. On the right, you can see the output. Our strings, prefix, and suffixed with a dash. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have this struct of a visitor that has an ID and the number of visits to the platform. If we create an array of those visitors, we then use the first operator to get the first visitor whose visits is greater than 10. We subscribe, print the value, and store our subscription. As you can imagine, the first visitor that has visits greater than 10 is this visitor with this random ID and the number of visits as 11. Let's go through another publisher. This publisher is called the pass-through subject, and it's kind of like what the name sounds. It passes through or publishes the type you send to it. So in this declaration, we're defining this publisher as a pass-through subject that can publish a string and can never fail. When we receive values from that subject, we print the completion as well as the value. Pass-through subjects are really great to bridge imperative code with the combined model. So then, using this pass-through subject, we call send with the text yo, followed by the completion event. What we would receive is received value yo and received completion finished. Now that we've taken a quick look at combine, let's see how we can apply these concepts to our SDK. First up is the app info module. It conforms to collector just like before, but we're gonna change the collector protocol in a little bit. First, we declare a private pass-through subject that publishes an app info model. If you remember, this app info is the type of model that we use just in this module. We declare this subject private because we don't want to expose the implementation details to the other modules as well as the outside world. We may want to change this in the future. So we're using this app info model internally to this module, but we really want a dictionary of string any to expose to the core module. So how do we do that? If you're thinking map, you're right. 
Each of our modules are going to have a public publisher property that'll publish the type the core module needs to package up that request object to send to the platform. So we declare this public publisher property to be a type of any publisher, which is a type erased publisher that publishes a string any dictionary and can never fail. Using that subject in our map operator, when we get the app info model, we can create our dictionary like before. And then finally, we call erase to any publisher to create that type erased publisher. Again, we don't want to expose implementation details to the outside world. Instead, we want to use this type erase publisher, any publisher. Lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to change the collect method to not return a string any, since that's already handled by our public publisher property. So we're going to change the collector protocol to just have the collect method, but not return that string any dictionary since it's already returned in the publisher. The core module will subscribe to that publisher instead. So in the collect method, what we need to do since we're using this pass through subject is to actually send that data on through. So using the internal app info model, we send that to the pass through subject. Then we send the completion event. We send the completion event in the app info module because this type of data can't change. Whether someone uses your app and they're on the home screen or they complete a level, the app name and app version aren't going to change. So we can collect this data once and be done with it. The device info module will look pretty similar to the app info module we just looked at. We declare a private subject that's a pass-through subject publishing the device info model and can never fail. It has a public publisher property of that type string any that the core module is looking for. In the map operator, we use the device info model to get the data into our dictionary. Then like before, we call erase to any publisher. The one difference here is in the collect method, we send the device info object, but we don't send a completion event. If you think about it, this data can change. They might be in portrait or landscape, depending on where they are in your app. Okay, so we've looked at the app info module and the device info module. In both of these two modules, I would say that combine isn't really adding us anything extra here. We're kind of shoehorning the combined model to make it work with our current code. We're manually calling subject.send in the collect call when we need the data in the core module. Let's take a look and see what the connectivity module looks like. In the connectivity module, we define a private pass-through subject that publishes an NW path type. If you haven't used the network framework before, you can use the NW path to find out network information, like if you're on Wi-Fi or cellular. In our public publisher property, we use the map operator again to map the NW path properties to the keys in our dictionary, just like we did in the previous modules. In the collect method, we use our NW path monitor that gets initialized in the initializer, and we pass it a closure that gets run every time the network changes. So when the network changes, we send that NW path object through our subject. And the last thing we need to do is start our monitor on a queue. All right, in the connectivity module, this seems to work a lot better. We're actually listening to those network changes over time, as opposed to the device info module and the app info module, where we were manually sending that data. Let's see how the location module looks next. Similar to our previous module, the location module has a private subject that publishes a CO location object. Because core location can throw core location errors, we want to bubble these up from the location module to the core module to let the clients know if they need to. So this pass through subject has a failure type of CL error. In the public publisher property, we map that subject just like we did in the previous modules, but also carry around that CL error information. In the publisher property, we map the location object to our latitude and longitude. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with core location as it's been one of the oldest Apple APIs. So you know it gets location updates in its delegate methods, did update locations, as well as any errors in did fail with error. So with each of these, whether we get a location or we get an error, we can just pass that through the pass through subject. All right, in the location module, similar to the connectivity module, we're getting a lot of great usage out of combine. Here we're listening to the location updates as they happen compared to the first two modules where we kind of had a shoehorn to make combine work. And what's great now is we have the same code constructs throughout our SDK. Let's take a quick pause and look at another publisher called Future.
Now a future is a publisher that publishes one value and then completes. So let's pretend we want to create a test method called random visitor that returns a future sometime in the future. Like if we were trying to model an API where we were trying to get a random visitor. So in the closure, we get either a single value published by the future or an error. So we can use GCD's async after to wait for one second and then successfully return a random visitor from our visitors array we had on our previous slide. You can subscribe to this future just like any other publisher. You call sync, use the value, and then store the subscription. One thing nice about futures is you can wrap APIs that normally take in a callback. In iOS 14, there's this concept of reduced and full accuracy when monitoring a user's location. So let's pretend you only have reduced accuracy and you want to request full accuracy temporarily. You can do so with iOS 14's new method, request temporary full accuracy authorization that uses a callback API. We can wrap this callback API with a future, giving us the same combined model syntax throughout the rest of our code base. That would look something like this. We have our own method called request temporary full accuracy that returns a future. Publishers that don't publish a value can just use void. Because this is a core location API that can publish a core location error, we need to have the failure type here as CL error. Then in the closure, we use location manager's new request temporary full accuracy authorization method. And we can resolve the feature with a failure if we get an error, or we resolve it successfully. All right, so we've looked at four different modules where each of those modules publish a string any dictionary. In the core module, we're going to subscribe to the individual modules so those individual modules can push their data to the core module. So this is one of the main differences I like to think of with combine. In combine, we're getting more of a push model where those individual modules are pushing their data to the core module. Let's take a quick look and see what that core module may look like. Now, one of the great things about combine is the operators. You don't have to maintain so much of your own code, but instead can leverage the system frameworks. So with the publishers that publish the same type of string any and never fail, we can use the merge operator to interleave that data together without having to write any code ourselves. That would look something like this, where we take our first publisher, the app info module publisher, and merge it with the device info module publisher and the connectivity module publisher. And let's say sometime later down the line, we create a new module. And this module keeps track of time. We'll call this the time info module, and it has a publisher just like the other modules. So now when we subscribe, the merge operator automatically interleaves these events. And then we can just call self.datalayer.add, adding all of the data from the different publishers to one central object. Using a quick demo app created in SwiftUI, I can send the event level completed with the level and the score. And once I send that event, you can see this is what your data layer would look like in the app. All of that data is collected, ready to be validated, and then later sent to the server. So you've taken a look at the collection step. Now on to the next step in the chain, validation. Validation is a really important step. It allows us to configure when should we send the data. Should we send the data if a user's device doesn't have that much battery left, or if the device doesn't have a good internet connection? Consent management laws are becoming more and more complex with things like GDPR, CCPA, and Common. If you watched any of Apple's WWDC 2020 videos, you'll know that Apple takes your privacy seriously. And if you're building an SDK, you're gonna also wanna honor your user's choices. So let's take a look at how we could use Combine to build a consent management module within the validation step. Let's take a cursory look at a basic implementation of consent management. The first thing to do is to define your consent status. We'll have three states. Consented, yes, I agree to share my data with you. Declined, no, no thank you, I don't wanna share my data with you. Or unknown, hmm, I haven't decided yet if I'd like to share my data with you. Now, our new consent module is gonna to conform to a validator that has one property, a validator that's a publisher of a type Boolean. This consent module exposes a public method called change consent status that a client using the SDK can use after they display a prompt asking the user for their consent. Depending on what their user chooses and if the user chooses to consent, 
we can send the value true to our private pass through subject. If the user declines to consent or is still unknown, we don't really need to do anything here. So we only publish a value through our publisher if the user actually consents to sharing their data with us. Remember that data layer object we had before? Well, that data layer object also has a publisher. So we've collected the data, but we don't actually publish it anywhere else into the system unless you've consented. And we can do that with the drop operator. The drop operator will drop all events until it receives an event from the consent modules validator. This way, until a user consents, our data stays on the device and doesn't actually go anywhere. Assuming we do get consent, we can then send the data through one of the SDK's dispatchers that sends the data to the platform. If we go back to the demo app, you can see when the consent is unknown, your data stays on the device. If we decline consent, the same thing happens. We try to send data off, but it doesn't actually hit the server. Finally, if the user does grant their consent to us, then when we try to send the data, it will actually hit the platform. All right, so you've looked at collecting the data, validating the data, now onto the third step in the chain, dispatching the data to the platform. If you've looked at combined code over the past year, you might have seen the new publisher on URL session. You can use the new data task publisher on URL session like so. Pass in a URL and receive back the data and the response. Along with the URL, you can also use a URL request. That's what we're going to use in this SDK. We've been passing around that string any dictionary. Now it's time to use JSON serialization to serialize that string any dictionary and set it in our URL request that goes to the server. Now that use case is pretty simple. But as an analytics SDK, you want to be cognizant of the user's device. You don't want to have to send an event every time a track call is made. Instead, wouldn't it be nice to batch up those events? Well, using Combine, this is super easy to do. Combine has a collect operator that receives all the items and returns them in an array. So in our collect dispatcher, if we want to batch up our events, we could do something like this. We take in the batch size and pass that to the collect operator. When we receive the values, we get the array of events. We could just pass that array of events to the platform, but we want to be a little bit smarter on the client side as well. We know that each of these events are going to have some shared information, things like your account, your profile, your environment, your app info, your app name, your device. That information isn't going to change per user, per device. So what we want to do is create a special batched event object where we remove the shared items and put them into their own section. That's what this collect dispatcher dot batch method does. It creates that special batched event object to send to the platform. Then we can use our API client, which uses data task publisher behind the scenes to send our batched event. All right, that's really cool. We're able to leverage Combine's collect operator and package up our request object before we send it to the platform. In the demo app, let's go ahead and send off five events like we completed five different levels. As you can see, as I'm creating these events, none of the events are going to the server yet. And then finally, after the fifth event is sent, we see all five events show up in the platform. All right, so you've collected the data, validated the data, and now dispatch that data to the platform. Now the data is in the platform, what can you do with it? Well, it really depends on which platform you choose, but I'll go over a simple use case called assigning a badge. Now we're gonna set up a scenario called high scoring gamer, and we're gonna assign that badge for that high scoring gamer. So our conditions are going to be that high scoring gamer has to complete at least three levels. And we're also going to have a second condition that says they need to score at least 5,000 points over the levels they've completed. So in this call, I'm only interested in level complete, so I can count how many levels were completed, and the score, so again, I can accumulate that score over the levels they completed. If a gamer comes into the system and they finish this first level, second level, and this third level, 
even though they finish three levels, unfortunately, they don't get the badge high scoring gamer because they don't have 5,000 points yet. But if they finish a fourth level and then get 5,000 points total, they'll be able to get that badge high scoring gamer. Let's see what it looks like in the platform. This is a tool called trace that we have that allows you to inspect events as they come into the system. This way, you can see how what you configured in the platform affects your visitor's profile. Currently, this is a fresh install of the app. So I'm a new visitor in the system. So all my variables on the left hand side are empty. When I send my first event that a level was completed with the score 1000, you can see on the left hand side, we get total levels completed and my total score, along with other information that we collect. My next event will be level two with the score 2000. And my third event will be level three with the score 1500. Now, if you remember from the slides, we need to finish at least three levels and have a total score of 5,000 points in order to get that sweet badge, high scoring gamer. So far, we haven't met the condition of scoring 5,000 points. So our badge, high scoring gamer is still unassigned on the left here. Let's go ahead and finish another level in order to get our total score up to 5,000 points. Awesome. Now that we've met both conditions, we get assigned the badge, high scoring gamer. All right, so the visitor profile information is in the system, including the high scoring gamer. From there, you can fire off actions or connectors server side, or you can fetch that data and perform a customized experience in the client. Now, are you going to want to fetch that data every time you send a request to the platform thinking your visitor profile information changed? Maybe depending on your configuration, but maybe it also doesn't change that much and you'd rather set up a polling interval that checks for changes in the visitor profile service. Let's see how to do that second one in Combine. Start by creating a method called fetch visitor profile that returns a type erased publisher that has an output type of visitor profile. Use Combine's data test publisher to fetch the data and then use map to just get the data part of the result, followed by decode to get the actual concrete type we're looking for. If there are any errors, replace them with a visitor profile that has no attributes. Now timers in iOS have always been a little tricky to work with, but combine can make it much simpler. On timer, call dot publish and define an interval to publish dates on the main run loop in the common run loop mode. A timer publisher conforms to the connectable publisher protocol, which means you have to explicitly call connect in order to receive events. Or you can use auto connect that calls connect when you subscribe. Then use map to fetch our visitor profile here. In order to cancel any requests, we use the switch to latest operator, and that's it. If we head to the demo app, we can start polling and throw up some confetti for our high scoring gamer. All right, that covers everything I wanted to talk about today, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Again, my name is Jonathan Wong, and in my day job, I work at a company called Telium. In my nightlife, I'm a video team member and server side Swift team member at wayrenderlich.com. I also author courses for Pluralsight, and if I have any time after that, I run my own blog and YouTube channel called Mobile Under 10. I'm not the most active person on Twitter, but you can find me at Fatty Waffles. Not because I love waffles, but because I have a cat named Waffles that's super, super fat. I hope you all have a great rest of your 360i dev, and hopefully we get to meet in person next year. Thanks again. I won't lie, I totally wondered about the Twitter ID. So that's good to know. Um, well, and it was actually on my list of things to ask and I forgot before we started. So now, now I know, so that helps. Um, let's see if we've got some, any left questions. Remember if you have not already, that's the Slack channel. Oops, I did not turn on my camera either. There you go. Uh, if you've got any questions, fire them off in that Slack channel so that we can pick a few live before we turn over to the next talk in a bit. Um, <laughs> Okay, lots of questions about fatty waffles. There we go. So that's a normal size cat. <laughs> and that's the much bigger cat. So what's what it look like? <laughs> Eric, you missed it. It was fatty waffles was on cam. <laughs> you might have to go back and show the cat again. All right. Let's see here. 
<laughs> Can you sing? He's famous now. <laughs> he looks like he appreciates it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like you might, oh, there's a few folks typing. They might just be laughing at the cat, though. Uh, you may have tackled all of the questions. So we'll see right. if anyone has any. But uh, if not, thank you very much. That was amazing. Uh, I very Thanks. much appreciate your being here. <laughs> uh, Fatty Waffles is definitely getting internet famous. Might have to make her, uh, is it him or her? Uh, boy, yeah. Might have to make him trend. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so it's all about cats. So uh, yeah. we will sign off, and the next uh, talk, we've got some time, uh, will be at uh, ele uh, blah, 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 11 o'clock with Nick. So feel free to walk around, stretch, uh, get some work done, get some emails answered. And we will be back here in just under 30 minutes. So thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.